Good day, Jeannie. First of all, let me thank you for agreeing to do this video interview with me today over Zoom. Thanks so much for having me, Guy. It's been uh, quite a while since we last met, and it's even further back when we first met. We were at a client site way back in the early months of 1983. So I'd like to get to that at some point in the in the uh, interview here, but let's let's hold off on that for a second. Let me go with my first question. And for our audience, would you please introduce yourself and tell us your name and then start with where you grew up. My name is Jeannie Anderson and I grew up in Illinois in a northern suburb of Chicago. I went to college at Northern Illinois University. First, I was studying uh, the visual arts and that led me to the design of visual messages and instructional technology. I worked after that in the Chicago area designing technical training at AT&T after some consulting and an internship um, and then moved later uh, after about 10, 12 years, I moved to Minnesota where I taught instructional design. And I did that for about 25 years. After retiring from teaching, I moved to Northern Wisconsin where I am right now. Very cool. So our, when we first met, uh, it was at MCC Powers, and you just reminded me before we, before we started the recording what that stood for. And I guess I knew that because it sounded familiar when you said that. But, but uh, so what were you doing at MCC Powers in 1983, and how long had you been working for them? I worked, that was my internship, and I worked there for nine months. Mm -hmm. um, it was supposed to be a three-month internship, but they kept extending it. And they were really surprised when I left at Christmas and went to AT&T, um, which I love. That, that was a wonderful job. And uh, I honestly didn't, couldn't believe how much I enjoyed doing a job like that and getting paid for it. <laughs> when I studied the fine arts, I, uh, I didn't particularly like the idea of being a a uh, starving artist. And so that's why I moved into instructional design. Well, so tell us, so what did you do at AT&T? Who did you serve? What, what was I, was, I was designing technical training. Mm -hmm. uh, later, I moved into a marketing position. But interestingly enough, what I was doing in the marketing job was evaluation. So that was a uh, fascinating job because I got to talk to a lot of the uh, clients that had been there uh, six months, nine months, uh, 12 months previous. And I also talked to their uh, managers to see how they were applying the skills. Mm -hmm. So uh, after that is when you uh, moved to Minnesota and went to work. Where, where did you uh, where, where did you teach in Minnesota? I was teaching at St. Cloud State University. Uh, during the time I was at AT and T, I completed a doctorate, and uh, then I uh, went to Minnesota. I knew I didn't want to go south because uh, my experience in the south. My mother's from the South. I have a lot of family down there. Every time I went down there, I was dying of the heat. <laughs> I decided I wanted to go North instead. Um, but Northern, uh, I mean, um, St. Cloud State University was a, a great place to work. I really enjoyed the students and I taught um, instructional design, design of online learning, uh, human performance technology, research, uh, and that because the technology is changing, the job was always changing. So it was uh, never boring. Well, excellent. And you said that earlier, uh, before we started the recording, that, that you've done a lot of online teaching. That's so right. As we're in the midst of a global pandemic, COVID-19, and there's been a mad rush to move content from more traditional delivery mechanisms to online virtual kinds of teaching, but you must have a lot of experience with that. Right. It was 
uh, mostly with graduate students. I did some undergraduate students. Um, some undergraduate students are good at it and they, uh, they appreciate it because they, you know, don't have to uh, leave home. Not all students are, are uh, you know, really, really enjoying online learning. Um, mm -hmm. My grandchildren are doing online learning. They're, some of them are in grade school, some are in high school, one is in college. Um, and frankly, <laughs> the youngest is doing the best. <laughs> so um, the big key there is interaction. I think that a lot of that takes place naturally in a face-to-face uh, -face classroom. But we have to be really intentional about designing interactions that are effective for um, online learning. Yes, thank you for that. So let's uh, shift gears here slightly and talk about uh, your first exposure to what I'm calling HPT, Human Performance Technology. It's known by uh, uh, many different names and labels, or evidence-based practices for performance improvement or however you refer to it. But, but how do you refer to it and when did you first come across this? Um. When I first started my graduate program in um, instructional technology, uh, the professors there were involved in the Chicago chapter of, of NSPI, which became ISPI, um, mm -hmm. and they took van loads of students to the meetings. And uh, there I learned about HPT, and that became the basis for how I practiced designing training. Okay, uh, can you share with us uh, so that we might share that with our audience here? Who are some of your biggest influences in this? Uh, people, articles, or books, so that we can kind of point people to some resources. You know, if I went all the way back, I'd have to say that one of my biggest influences is Robert Gagne. Um, later, uh, Briggs and Gagne uh, principles of instructional design. Later, as, a, uh, as I was teaching online, I really learned to appreciate uh, Richard Meyer's uh, multimedia principles. And mm -hmm. you know, he has two books. One is multimedia uh, learning. The other is multimedia principles. Both of them are wonderful. The principles is uh, the more academic of the two. Um, there have been numerous articles that I've really appreciated from Performance Improvement Journal and uh, PIQ, uh, Performance Improvement Quarterly, that influenced me. Uh, but probably the biggest uh, influences have been the people I met through ISPI and other organizations in the field. And that, that would include um, Gary Rumler, uh, Judy Hale, Dennis Fields, even Guy Wallace. <laughs> Where do I send the check? No, no, just kidding. Um, well, oh, thank you for identifying some of these. I think that uh, uh, new people coming into the field, you know, they need some pointers and there's a lot of content. There's a lot of self-proclaimed gurus. Um, and there's a lot of things that we seem to be revisiting that have been uh, touched upon previously. And we're, you know, there's a lot of reinventing of the wheels and you know, from a marketing perspective, renaming things that have been done and known about for decades now. It's, uh, but uh, let, let me shift gears slightly uh, again. Um, if you, I know you're retired now, but if you were to give us a 30 second elevator speech as a way of uh, giving an example to the audience here, so a 30 second elevator speech on what you just most previously did, what would that be? Well, the first thing is I uh, would like to take a step back and say that um, every job I've had in this field has been interesting, uh, but perhaps the most interesting project was on community change. In 2016, I was invited to Tucson to uh, to do a project 
uh, a cognitive task analysis with a group of communi community development facilitators. And these people all had fascinating stories of community development, community change, from open housing during the civil rights movement, youth development, child protective services, and so on. This project was really about knowledge management because these people are aging and we're, there's the potential to lose sight of their really effective uh, facilitation techniques and knowledge. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I found during that time, I was down there for several days, uh, doing a really intensive kind of workshop with them. And uh, community change has much in common with change and performance improvement in, um, it, in business, in the workplace. And one of the facilitators, after I got all done and shared with them this big table and, and uh, decision chart and so on, that um, she said, would you be willing to help me write a book about this? Because she was a genius at storytelling and not so great about uh, writing uh, expository, you know, kinds of things. And so we, we wrote a book called Managing Ch or Making Change and uh, Facilitating Community Action. And that one is, has just been released last month and it's now available through uh, Rutledge, uh, their website, through um, Amazon. So to get to the 30 second <laughs> elevator speech, what I've been currently doing, I finished writing this, I've, I've been doing a lot of uh, volunteer work, uh, working with nonprofits and community organizations. And it sounds like it's a real different experience from working with business organizations, but really the same principles uh, when you're talking about making change can be, can be used, the same principles, same processes uh, as in human performance technology. Focus on outcomes take a systematic view, work in partnership, uh, determine needs and causes, design your solutions, and then implement and evaluate them. Mm -hmm. So that's my 30 second. <laughs> well, thank you. So, but let's go back to your book, hold that up again, and um, tell us who's, who was your target? Uh, uh, let's see if I can get that. Yeah, making change. Yep, making change. Community action. So who's it written for? Who is that written for? Uh, anybody who is on the forefront of trying to make change, and I think in, in this day and age, it's needed as much as it ever was. Um, it could be people in, um, in, in the library, in the, in the community who are concerned about um, homelessness, hunger, um, it could be people who are on school boards or uh, governmental organizations that are trying to bring the community together to solve the unique community problems. It could be people who are in public health. I think there's a big need for that right now. Uh, people in um, all kinds of areas. Uh, some of the the ISPI community service projects uh, could use this. And I know that at least one university uh, in the South has adopted this for their social work program. Oh, excellent. Well, thank you. So tell us a little bit about your uh, co-author. My co-author, Maureen Pyle, has been a, a community organizer and facilitator for at least 40 years. Uh, she's been working on social change in a, many different professional and volunteer organizations, including things like uh, mental health, uh, child uh, protection. Um, it, even has, she's been actively involved in an organization called Play for Peace that brings together people uh, young people from opposite gangs to play non-competitive games together. Uh, she holds a master's degree in organizational development and linguistics. 
Mm, very interesting. Well, thank you for sharing that. So is the book available both as a paperback or uh, ebook as well? Yep. It's in hardback, paperback, and ebook. And uh, through all the uh, t t typical uh, sources for uh, reading materials nowadays? Yep. Excellent. Well, hopefully we'll send the audience uh, that way to check it out further. Let me uh, shift gears a little bit here. As a lifelong learner, uh, can you share with us anything that you're currently focused on or what's next for you in ways of learning? And, and are you working on any new writings or, or, or such? What can you share with us? Um, can, you, can you ask that again? Well, what, what, what are you focused on as a learner? Uh, are, you're retired, but I'm guessing you're, you've not given up uh, um, uh, d developing yourself or, or have a, a, an area of interest that you're exploring. I think one of my big interests is something that I don't think we could cover enough in this, in this book, and that is communication, and especially communication between peoples with different perspectives. Uh, we have a lot of division in the nation and in uh, individual communities. I have a, a colleague that I taught with for several years who is just a genius at bringing people together. And um, he's one of the people like, like Maureen who um, tells incredible stories to illustrate their points. Um, things that you won't forget, but not so much the, uh, the, the academic or the ex, uh, expository kind of writing. And so I, I'd love to invite him to, to uh, collaborate with me to do something like that. Mm -hmm. um, so that's uh, one of the things I've been thinking about how I might organize that, how I might uh, engage him in, in writing um, we'll see. <laughs> well, cool. Well, thank you for sharing that with us. Uh, let's kind of go back next. Um, well, first of all, is there a favorite performance improvement term or phrase that you would like to define for us? And I usually set this up by, by saying perhaps there's a, a, a term or a phrase that annoys you because people are misusing it or misconstruing it or, or such. But we, we are opportunity rich with our language. Uh, Joe Hartless used to complain about this back in the 1980s and uh, doesn't seem to have gotten any better. So do you have a particular phrase or term that you would like to share with us? Yeah, I would. Um, I would really like to, to share the, the term readiness. This is something I never picked up in, uh, as a graduate student. It's something I gradually became aware of. Um, HPI involves uh, changes that might run from the small and incremental in intervention to the, all the way to the transformational. Uh, to succeed in implementing those changes, people need to be ready. When they're ready, they exhibit a desire for change, uh, a belief that change is possible, and that beliefs outweigh the risks. I mean, that benefits outweigh the risks and a belief that the existing community or organization uh, can accommodate that change. So assessing readiness really needs to be part of that needs analysis. But what we usually find is they're not. Uh, but don't despair, because if your community is not quite ready yet for change, start where they are and build readiness as part of your solution. Do you have any uh, specific uh, guidelines that you might uh, uh, share with people about how to get, <laughs> yeah, get people could, ready? <laughs> if I could find that chapter, actually, ah. the whole chapter in the book on on readiness, and um, and it has several different strategies that you can use. And I'm thinking that my brain is turning to mush. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that that's fine. But anyway, so we've you've got we've already pointed people to your book, and now they have a darn good reason to go there for uh, specifically to uh, absolutely. You can use the same principles for that that are in in the book uh, in your in your business, 
Uh, you can also use it, in, of course, in the in the community. Okay. Well, thank you. Uh, let's shift again uh, slightly to um, uh, maybe this is revisiting what you may have shared with us uh, in an earlier question, but but uh, I'd like to explore with you a little bit more about the people who influenced you early on in your practice. Again, I'm trying to help point people, uh, our audience, perhaps uh, new to the uh, field of uh, performance-based instruction or performance improvement by any means, but uh, who were some of your uh, key influencers and, and tell us a little bit about them and uh, what you learned from them. You know, I, I think I'd really like to focus on Judy Hale. Okay. Um, I first met Judy in late 1982 when I was a graduate student at a meeting of the Chicago chapter of ISPI. And I attend, attended many of her presentations and workshops. I had the pleasure of working with her when I uh, was on the board uh, of the Chicago chapter. And I found not only is she knowledgeable about the field of performance improvement, but she can cut through the fog of uh, the, the performance situation and really identify uh, what the issues, is, issues are both accurately and quickly. She was and still is energetic, open, easy to work with. And back in, in uh, my Chicago days, she also was willing to spend time with newbies like me uh, in the field and she could illustrate her points with stories that I can still remember 40 years later. Very interesting. Yeah, she's a, she's a, she is a gem. I've she is. Videos with her in the past and she's on my list to do one again here soon. Um, and uh, I'm sure that she'll appreciate it. But I think that, uh, yeah, people should definitely take a look at her work. She's got many articles. Um, she's got a, a number of books out available, and I think that she's a good resource for anybody to follow up on. Um, Jeannie, thank you so much for participating with me in this video interview. My, my final question to you is, do you have any parting words of wisdom or guidance for our audience? particularly those who are new to the field related to all things, anything related to performance improvement? I would say that I would want them to get involved in an organization such as ISPI or any of the others in the field and hope that they can find people like Judy that they can connect with and learn from. Thank you. And Jeannie, thank you so much for doing this with me today. Have a great day. Thank you. Bye-bye.